Justin, Lauren, myself, and Robin were kind of planning this whole thing. Um, we contacted Excite Design, and they very graciously immediately said, yeah, we want to be a partner in this. And they did a great, great partner in putting together everything that's happening here today. And kind of a bit of a mentor because they had a little bit more experience in doing this than we have. So I'd like to thank you very much, Bernie, and with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Does this thing work or no? Yes. Or you can do. You can, maybe yeah, I can. I can do this. That's right. Okay. Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks, Taylor. Um, hi. Uh, it's really good to see all of you here. Thank you so much. Uh, this is really a, a great honor to be a part of this. Um, I'm seeing a lot of friends and folks that uh, that I've both worked with as well as uh, encountered over a variety of uh, experiences throughout the years. The, um, so uh, <clears throat> Ted, Ted mentioned that the, uh, the uh, name of this thing was, was Raising the Bar <clears throat> Equitable Urban Planning in Chicago. Uh, actually, that would be incorrect. If I, unless you have about two or three days to talk about urban planning, that's just not going to happen. Uh, but what we will do is talk about equity in public space. Um, so if, if you're bored already, you know, uh, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, the, the inequity of urban planning has led us to more than half the subject matters that uh, we're talking about today uh, at Think Tank. The homeless, homelessness, uh, affordable housing, uh, park spaces, water and other resources, transportation and access are all issues of urban planning that, that you know, we, we have to address on a regular basis. Uh, but they all merit their own uh, discussion and we could go on for days on that. Um, so we are going to focus today on just uh, parks and public spaces and uh, we'll see where that gets us. So I kind of wanted to start. Um, our firm uh, is uh, almost 30 years old. Uh, we have been uh, very fortunate to do a number of projects throughout the city of Chicago, and now we're uh, doing work all over the country. Um, and it's been really exciting. Uh, one of the things that we do in our firm is we have been uh, really uh, deliberate about the folks that we hire, and, and we think that it's, it's really important to have a lot of diversity and have people from everywhere, from South Africa to Australia to every country in Asia, coming up with different ideas. And, and those ideas, uh, although the regulatory stuff here in the States may be a little bit difficult, those ideas really start to uh, uh, flush out in, in a lot of our designs. So we're really excited about that. Um, it's also hard to keep up with the number of languages that are spoken in our office, but we have a lot of fun and we draw a lot. That's our folks. Uh, the one who does a lot of the uh, QAQC is the one on the bottom uh, right. Uh, <laughs> so when, when we go to a client, we say, I'm sorry we couldn't deliver it. The dog ate our homework. <laughs> it's true. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, you know, the things that are happening throughout the entire country. There are a lot of signature parks that are developing throughout the country that are really uh, revenue generating for a lot of cities. I mean, we saw the impact of, of Millennium Park here in Chicago. And then here we are uh, almost 10 years later from the finish of that, and there are billions and billions of dollars that have been kind of generated from that, from all the storefronts, from the hotels, and now the real estate from the Chicago River uh, to Millennium Park, that real, those real estate prices have, have jacked up uh, incredibly. And that's happening all over the place. You see what has happened at the High Line and the real estate values that have developed over, uh, you know, throughout New York City because of that. And, and to a point where uh, in, in Dallas, the same thing is happening with Clyde Warren Park. Um, the Big Dig actually started to raise a lot of real estate prices in Boston. Now they have a casino that um, Chicago really ought to look at, I think, uh, as, we, as we move forward in that, in that discussion. Uh, Millennium Park, as mentioned before. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park has really been instrumental in a lot of the things that have been going on in, um, uh, in Brooklyn. The, 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 the transformation of Brooklyn uh, 20 years ago actually was not a very favorable place to live, and now it's the place to live in New York City. 
Chicago's made up of a number of neighborhoods, and, and that's what we have uh, been built on. And urban planning really has been a, a product of that. Uh, things like um, the Dan Ryan Expressway that kind of split Bridgeport away from uh, the projects on the east side and, um, and has divided the city into these neighborhoods. And, and we're all very, actually, uh, pretty provincial if you think about it. When, when people uh, start to ask, oh, where do you live in the city of Chicago, you start to identify with, with a particular neighborhood. Yeah. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that is interesting, though, is, you know, these signature parks really have started to, uh, to develop their own, um, uh, uh, their own identity in terms of defining uh, these cities. So when we get to the neighborhoods, though, that spend, you know, instead of $725 million for Millennium Park, you're spending about a million, maybe two millions on a neighborhood park. Right, and so we start to talk about well, what is the equity there? And the equity really is is something that you know we, we really have to look at. And on top of that, there's now this discussion of every time you do a a nice park in any uh, neighborhood, all of a sudden that follows with gentrification, and that's been a real difficult subject to to, uh, to for us as landscape architects to deal with because. You know, we don't want to dumb down the design. We don't want to make something bad. But at the same time, there is that function of how do you deal with that? Now, come up with a uh, idea that has been talked about a little bit, a little bit further. Um, but a lot of these projects really have to do with these neighborhoods and the authenticity and the ownership of them. So these are some of the kind of the guerrilla uh, treatments that neighborhoods have had. Um, so, you know, when you start to look at, um, you know, do-it-yourself DIY projects in any particular neighborhood, a neighborhood group gets together and says, hey, let's throw a party, let's paint a bunch of stuff on the ground, or let's build some benches in the parkway. And those are the kinds of things that really start to enhance these neighborhoods and start to give a lot of ownership to those neighborhoods, and it doesn't require that, that big spend. Uh, this is a project in Philadelphia, which is completely, you know, taking a street and just putting paint on the ground, and that's really exciting. Um, so, you know, in terms of developing these public spaces as economic drivers, you know, is there a balance, a way to balance that local support and enthusiasm to sustain those, those spaces? So, I'm going to take you through a journey of a lot of our projects, uh, primarily here in Chicago, um, of our large... Uh, projects that have really made an impact. Uh, Lakeshore East, um, which was a master plan by SOM. Uh, the original park design was done by um, the office of James Burnett out of Houston. And uh, Magellan Development asked us, can you get this project done you know, on time and on budget? And we, of course, we said, yes, we can. And so then we started on this uh, particular project, which was a 30-foot drop from Randolph Street down to uh, the park level. The beauty of this, though, was that there were two things that were going on. Number one was that the park was done, as you can see, before any of the other buildings were built. So that was kind of the key and an instrumental thing for the Department of Planning to start to say to developers, we want to get this feature done before you start building any buildings. And it became the centerpiece of this neighborhood. And as you can see now, 15 years later, they're still building. During the recession, there was the only, them and the University of Chicago were the only cranes in the air at that time. And, and so that was really exciting to see how that's flourished. And now this has really become, this is now taken over by the Park District in terms of its ownership. But the people in that neighborhood really takes care of it. And every time I do a tour there, I always talk about, it's probably the best maintained park in the city, uh, in the uh, Park District uh, portfolio. Um, so if you haven't been there, uh, please get there and, and experience it. It's really exciting. There's a Marianos there, uh, and there are dogs that uh, shouldn't, should be in the dog park, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to find that guy $500 and we ought to start some, you know. Uh, Boeing Galleries is another one of our projects that we got started with. This is also kind of based on the success of the Crown Fountain. 
So one of the things I talk about is the, the unintended consequences of the, you know, places like the Crown Fountain. When that was being designed, and I remember seeing the renderings, they were all these night renderings, and they, it was supposed to be this contemplative space where you would look at the faces on this beautiful glass wall, and you would contemplate oh, humanity. Little did they know it was going to be the biggest, you know, children's water park there was in the city. And so the overflow uh, it became, hey, what can we do to that terrace above uh, Crown Fund so that we can start to uh, uh, reduce some of that, um, uh, the, the popularity there. And so this became this kind of uh, area for uh, moving sculptures. And the uh, Boeing certainly had a great time um, uh, sponsoring this. Uh, Light Street, uh, Lightscape uh, was one of these projects that uh, we actually, we were like, we don't know about lighting. But we had this idea of like, how do you start to uh, do something in urban planning that really starts to define uh, uh, an identity of the street. It, certainly, the budget wasn't really high, and the, um, the, the things that we had to go through in order to get this project done was pretty amazing. But this was uh, sponsored by the Chicago uh, Loop Alliance. And their, their criteria for this was uh, make it last for five years. So now it's been eight years, and it still plays music, and it's been uh, kind of nice, but I think it's, it is time for a refresh. So I think that's one of the discussions that are going on now. Uh, we were involved with the, um, both of these projects, the new Marriott uh, Marquis as well as the Wintrust Arena, um, and that has really started to impact uh, the South Loop and, and that whole area. And so the convention, you know, certainly MPEA realized that they were losing conventions to other cities and uh, upgrading uh, and stepping up their game was, was an important part of it. Well, part of that negotiation was developing a park for the neighborhood. So this is, you know, the park that was kind of developed as part of the, um, as a Marriott Marquis, and they actually maintain it, so that's kind of a nice thing. Uh, but the neighborhood really got something uh, really meaningful uh, back. Um, it was also a shared street. This is the second one in the city of Chicago. The first one we did was in Argyle, uh, which also changed that neighborhood too. And they do some fun things, these, uh, uh, bots that uh, look like they're holding up the building uh, was always kind of fun. Uh, the success of the Chicago River was uh, River Walk was really exciting. I mean, uh, this last year, the first day we had, you know, the weather was terrible. We had winter all the way through May, uh, but that first day of really nice weather, uh, city winery ran out of wine. That's like, that's like Chinese restaurants running out of rice. This is, you know, come on, it's wine. Uh, but it became so popular. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that happened was, um, and it was getting really overcrowded. Again, you know, unintended consequences. You don't know the success of it until there are more people than you know what to do with it. So in order to kind of accommodate that, um, uh, the mayor's office called and they said, hey, in November, the mayor wants to extend the river walk. And by the way, they, we need to get this designed and built in six months before he leaves office. So from November, December, January, February, March, April, May, six months, get this thing designed and get it built. And so we put our pencils to paper and we started cranking away. And this is kind of the, uh, you know, some of the thoughts that we started to have. How do you start to incorporate, because that's really a hardscape, the, the, the river walk. How do you start to incorporate a little bit more green in that space? Deal with all the vendors that are down there, because it, it quite frankly, looked like a trailer park uh, down there. Um, and uh, start to develop something a little nicer. And so we, we came up with these, you know, a variety of ideas. Vetted it through uh, both the mayor's office and, uh, and 2FM, and started coming up with these ideas and uh, cramped on it. And so uh, this is where we are now. And if you haven't been down there, it's pretty exciting uh, to see how popular it's become. Uh, the complaint about this one is that bicyclists now are saying, oh, we can't bike down there because your zigzagging is a little too abrupt and, you know, and there are too many people. That's another issue that you know we got to resolve, and there becomes a real question of should bikes be riding along the riverfront uh, along here? So it's, it it does become a big question. 
This is why bikers don't like it. We put boulders in the middle of things. Um, but the, the vendors have been extremely excited about it. Urban Kayaks and uh, Island Party Hut. And they're doing a brisk, brisk business. And so the revenue generation, oh, has <laughs> just been like. <laughs> um, but we've been, been doing a lot of neighborhood projects as well. A lot of you may be familiar with Ping Tom Memorial Park. Uh, so we continue to, you know, I showed Lakeshore East before. So we're beginning to get known as doing all the parks that nobody knows how to get to. Um, uh, and nobody does know how to really get to this park. And, uh, you have to go uh, halfway through Chinatown and then you're trying to find your way. Which street do you have to go down and et cetera, et cetera. One of the things that has happened though is that the water taxi has brought more people uh, down to this park, which has been really exciting. Um, and now, you know, with the, with the 78 coming online, um, we think that this, that this is really going to be important. One of the things that has been talked about, though, and I talked about this earlier about gentrification, Chinatown now is, uh, that, that issue is, is coming up in every community meeting, gentrification, and the impact of the 78 and how that's going to happen. So there are two things that I have said publicly about this. One of them is that the 78 actually as opposed to Sterling Bay, who has their stuff up on the North Branch, the 78 really needs these authentic neighborhoods such as Pilsen and Chinatown to survive. And, and I think, I say that very, very uh, candidly, because um, that's one of the draws, I think, to this part of the town, that, that you have access to Chinatown. Uh, but there is a buffer of an 18-acre park between the 78 and the heart of Chinatown. So. Um, you know, there's something to worry about, but I think there's some, also some natural barriers as well. Um, if you haven't been down there for the Dragon Boat races, um, you know, 50,000 people come down there. It is really, really exciting. And, um, but there are also places to um, really find uh, some peace and quiet, even amongst all of the traffic that goes there. The, the, the pink line is right there. There's uh, traffic on 18th Street. Boats going up and down the river. Uh, probably one of the most heavily trafficked parks, but you don't hear it in this park. Um, one of the other uh, expansions has been the boathouse that uh, has gone up and has become very popular. REI now runs the kayak rentals there. Um, so we can keep on going there. Palmasano Park is in the heart of Bridgeport. 27 acres. 27 acres is the same size as Millennium Park. We only got, I don't know, a budget of 17 million as opposed to, you know, that doesn't take you very far, I tell you. Um, but it was really exciting. This has been a place that had been used for a landfill for the city for construction debris for since 1972. Uh, when we got hold of it in 2000 and I think four or five, uh, you know, really starting to shape that land. Uh, and this used to be, um, you know, uh, one of the things that we'd like to say also, not a drop of water, uh, storm water on the 27 acres goes into the combined sewer system. It all goes, gets recirculated, and it all goes back down to this fishing pond, gets pumped back up, and, and that's what fills up the wetlands as well. But you can see this hole in the ground, it was about 300 feet deep at one time. And so the impact of this on this neighborhood has just been really astounding. And now folks use it and, uh, you know, uh, it, it was interesting the discussion of whether we should put in ball fields or whether we maintain this as this kind of native area uh, environmental park. And, and the neighborhood said, yeah, we'll, we'll do this. Uh, luckily, they had McGuinn Park right next door with tennis courts and basketball courts and everything else. So um, it, was, it became really exciting. Uh, during the winter months, it becomes even more exciting when we, you start to see things like this. Um, but kids have learned, they stock the fishing pond, by the way. Uh, so if you do have a fishing license, you can go down there. And uh, they actually have pulled some pretty big fish out of here. Um, what's the name of the park again? Uh, Palmasano Park. Uh, it used to be known as Stern's Quarry. Um, and it's uh, right at Hall 729th Street. So another park that you really wouldn't know how to get to, but um, you can find it going down to Halstead. It is so beautiful during the fall months. So if you uh, get down there in the next uh, few weeks, you might be able to see this. 
Uh, I mentioned Argyle uh, and, and one of the impacts that that has had on that particular neighborhood. Now it's become the place to go. The night markets are really super exciting. This is what it used to look like and what it's turned into. Uh, so everybody's asking, well, what are shared streets? Shared streets basically are the same streets that still have no curbs. So basically, uh, pedestrians kind of take this over. We did a traffic pattern that kind of like zigzagged its way through Argyle so that traffic would slow down. You still could park on the street. You could still maneuver your way uh, through it. Um, but everything, one of the things that, that happened was we were able to also deal with all of the ADA access from all these storefronts to the street as well. So by building that up and kind of creating this, this whole kind of single plane level uh, from the street all the way to the storefront, it became a really accessible and, and interesting place to go. Um, the night markets on Thursdays are just a, a crazy. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, Barlamay Park on the near west uh, side. So this is probably what gets thought of when we say you do a nice park uh, in an area that had you know this building on it. Uh, you go through a community process, um, and all of a sudden this happens. Gentrification comes, and now the West Loop, the prices there are just amazing. Um, uh, you know, but in this area, it, it was really good also, because if you think about it, the uh, residential market that has expanded into this has really uh, increased the tax base, which has been good for the city. Uh, again, not a drop of water goes into the combined sewer system. Uh, this is all detained on site. Uh, and then we also did an experiment of playground equipment. A lot of our, our work with the Chicago Park District, they, you know, has, has led us to these playground designs, which uh, the playground manufacturers like to say, oh, from like three to five years old, you should have this playground equipment. From, from five to 12 years old, you should have this. It's a way for them to make more money, right? They're like, split up these playground, you know, these playgrounds. And we said, you know, let's try something new. We put it all in there together. And one of the things that we found was that we found grandmothers playing with this stuff, you know? <laughs> and we saw bigger kids helping the little kids up the hills. And, you know, it was really exciting to see this. And, and nobody's gotten hurt. And, you know, it's just been a fun place. And uh, everything continues to maintain itself. And uh, now, you know, this park has really become uh, part of the West Loop. And uh, there's a lot of ownership in that particular neighborhood of this park. Uh, we're now working in Pullman, down on the far south side, 111th Street, and, uh, and uh, Cottage Grove. Um, we have gone through this process of a community process. Uh, actually, uh, uh, next week, all the uh, construction documents are due on this. But this is the, uh, there was a master plan that um, uh, Richard Wilson from, uh, well, actually, it was a, it was a Charette actually, done, sponsored by AIA from the National Parks Foundation um, and, um, uh, and CAC uh, had, had done this. Uh, and so we're hoping that this is going to happen, that the, the building is going to get restored. It has been named the National Monument uh, by President Obama. Um, and it's so start to bring even more activity down there. David Doig down there, who has been with uh, CNI, has just been amazing. Uh, getting uh, all the development down there from Method uh, to, to and Gotham Green's uh, love for Method Factory uh, and all the rest of the things. They have a Walmart down there. Uh, it, this is now really becoming an area that is starting to develop even further. We're doing a number of projects uh, called Space to Grow with MWRD and Chicago Public Schools. This is really kind of taking uh, primarily parking lots out of the Chicago, you know, these Chicago Public School uh, uh, sites and turning them into playgrounds. And that's been really exciting to see from, I should have put in a before photo, but this actually used to flood completely. It was a parking lot that used to flood. And, um, and so now we've developed these infiltration uh, ideas and stormwater best practices. Uh, so all the water now goes into the ground, into the ground. it's uh, filtered there, and, um, and eventually makes its way out. But 
the bigger impact is what it does with these kids. These kids are just so excited to get out there and to run around these, uh, you know, this track thing, um, you know, and, and it's been a huge success for not only MWRD, uh, it's a huge success for Chicago Public Schools as well. No. The things kids do, right? Yeah. It's amazing. It's really amazing. Uh, part 574 is the former Rockwell Gardens CHA uh, projects. And this has been uh, really kind of an interesting area. Again, not uh, one of the things that we also do in our parks is that we try not to uh, remove anything off that site and balance the site of you know the excavation versus the, the, the things that we try to build up there. And so as we started to excavate this site to, to put in the playground equipment and develop some of these things, we came up with so much dirt that it had to, we ended up with a 30 foot mound uh, there, uh, which has made it really exciting for these kids coming down the zip line. Um, and, and so now there's this, uh, the last three house winner um, uh, is, was right across the street from this, a development that is really amazing. And again, this area on the, on the west side has really developed into something that's really exciting for the na neighborhood. So, last thing is small interventions. What do you do, you know? Uh, this is a park district project, Renaissance Park, 79th and Ada. So this is actually right in the back door of St. Sabina. One of the things that I like to talk about with this is actually the ownership of this neighborhood into this. It's a very formal park design. There is a sculpture by a guy named Jersey Kunar that did this, and all of these uh, globes that are kind of stacked here has the name of a prominent African American that has been, you know, um, everybody from uh, Jesse Owens and, and Mahalia Jackson. Uh, uh, so it's just really an incredible thing in this neighborhood. But Saint Sabina, Saint Sabina, one of the things that Father Flager does here is he sends out his folks to clean this on a regular weekly basis. And so, you know, there's this ownership there now that the neighborhood has taken hold of and again, you know, keeps this park uh, pretty clean. Um, Dorchester Art uh, Collaborative was a project with Theester Gates. This is what it used to look like and this is what it looks like now. And so at Grand Crossing, really another pretty tough neighborhood down on the south side, uh, there used to be a lot of shootings down there, and they did this. This is uh, designed by uh, Landon Baker. Um, <clears throat> so they, he rehabbed all of these buildings into artist uh, housing, but also put this performance space in there, all glass. And, and this has been there now for five years. I just took a group of Danish architects down there to, to view the site, and it, it, no, nothing has happened. I mean, it, it is starting to attract more people there's now a playground that's across the street that was never used. Now it's being used. And now, you know, more and more buildings are continuing to get rehabbed uh, in this area. And it's really exciting to see the impact of this particular project. Um, so these small interventions, you know, really mean a lot. Uh, the Burnham at Woodlawn Park is by POA, um, uh, which is, uh, again, instrumental on, along Woodlawn right by the University of Chicago, but in an area that was, uh, you know, senior housing was really needed. Um, and so, you know, teaching uh, seniors about gardening and having a place for them to garden is really exciting as well. We continue to do these things called um, uh, nature play, and we, we're careful about how we call it because um, there are standards for playgrounds that uh, if you don't meet that ASTM standard, uh, you get cited for it. So we make sure that all these things, when we put in the rocks and the sand and uh, kids learn how to, about nature as opposed to these steel playground structures, uh, they start to have a lot of fun. And, and it's really exciting. I, I always, you know, my kids now are older, but, you know, they would get all these presents at Christmas. It was like crazy, you know, these, all these multiple pieces of, pieces of plastic. And I'd say, they need a ball to stick in a box. Come on, really? And, and it was kind of true, I mean, kids, they do a lot with their imagination. And this is what ends up happening, is they, they start to develop, uh, uh, and they want a little danger as well. So, you know, we continue to do these things. This is McKinley Park. This is what it used to look like, and this is what it is now. 
And this is also the input of this neighborhood and folks coming out to do actually the building of these things. And a whole lot of mulch in the ground and uh, you know hammocks and trees and uh, this is what happens. Um, uh, and, and so uh, this is not a park district park. This is, a, this is a neighborhood intervention and this is actually taken care of by the neighborhood uh, in McKinley Park. This is also kind of fun, teaching kids how trees are put together. Um, Columbia College, oh yeah, we just finished this. This opened up two weeks ago. That's what it used to look like, this kind of dark, nasty, uh, overgrown place. That's what it is now. And, and I'm seeing, you know, this is actually right down the street from our office, so I keep on seeing photo shoots being done here. Uh, and it's kind of exciting. And it's a very simple plan. Uh, that's it, you know, a few mountains, some pavement, some, a little uh, different color in the pavement and, and shapes, and, uh, and you, here you have it. Uh, and so, so, you know, we talked earlier about some of the guerrilla treatments. Um, we've been involved with a few of them. Some of you may know this. I've gotten a lot of flack for this. People either love it or they hate it. Uh, <laughs> um, but one of the things it has done is it's become a lot safer for people that actually cross the street. Drivers hate it, you know, they have to slow down, they have to wait for other people. But now there's this kind of safe zone in this uh, at Wellington, uh, what is it, Wellington, Southport, and, and, uh, and Lincoln Avenue. Um, and safe to the point that, you know, some of these people are eating up there now. Um, so it's been kind of a fun experiment, um, although, you know, I, it comes with a price. Uh, the criticism I've gotten from some of the folks that have lived there for a while, you know, how dare you do this? Uh, it's paint. <laughs> Uh, we, did, we submitted a competition in Winnipeg, um, uh, the city of Winnipeg, in Canada, and we, had, uh, we won it. This is a snow globe in, in Winnipeg, and we, then we had to build it in February. If you haven't been to Winnipeg, Winnipeg in February, it's probably the coldest place on earth. Um, but it was really kind of fun, and they take these, this is actually on the river right now, and then during the spring, they take them off and then they kind of put them back on. And a lot of different artists have, have submitted their things, uh, but these are kind of these things that happen. Um, we took over a CDOT intersection, uh, the corner of Racine and Blue Island, so this diagonal street. And there used to be this, uh, uh, I should have put it before photo here too, but there was this triangle that was just overrun by weeds and it was fenced in. And so, um, uh, with the help of the aldermen, we kind of like kind of secured this thing, and in six hours, volunteers created a park, and it was really amazing to see, you know, and it was just planted areas and paved areas, but in six hours, this is what happens, and now this neighborhood certainly has an area that they feel comfortable with, and it's right across the street from the police station, right down the street from the fire station, the one they use for uh, Chicago Fire. Um, and, um, you know, it, it just continues to be maintained. This year was the first year that the neighborhood really took ownership of it, and they, uh, they are now keeping dogs off of it, and et cetera, et cetera, but it's, it's fun. Uh, this is our, our uh, submittal for parking day, take over a parking spot. And so we came up with this idea of a, hamster, uh, uh, a human hamster wheel. And, you know, because we're all just running in circles, aren't we? And uh, so this is what happens when you put things out on the street, people start to say, hey. Uh, so I, the insurance here, let's not talk about that. <laughs> We're just making people sign waivers, that's what it is. <laughs> but it is a lot of fun. And it's really kind of exciting to see what people do. But I have this thing about, you know, should parks be sanctuaries? And we talk about that a lot about, about you know, um, the gun violence here in the city, you know, how do we start to do, deal with that? And, and one of these ideas is, you know, should, should there be an idea that we get out to the general public that parks really should be sanctuaries? And, and they should be places that people feel safe and they, they can go there and be able to relax and be able to think about uh, their lives and not having to fear about getting 
shock. And, uh, so that's an idea that I want to continue to push forward. The other idea, though, is uh, this idea called Parkway. So I went to a meeting, this is about a month and a half ago, in Humble Park. It was down in the basement of a community center. And I didn't know what to expect. I actually had no idea what I was getting into. And I went down there. And I was like, oh, it's the Socialist Workers Party. <laughs> Not that, you know, I'm fine with, you know, socialism to a point. Um, but it was about equity in parks. And this is the subject that we're talking about now about how do you start to uh, develop an idea of, of equity in, in our parks. And so I came up with this idea of we should start a new currency, a currency that is not taxed. And I want to, it was based on uh, this idea that they did in Los Angeles. They paired park development with affordable housing. You remember that we, I just talked to you about you develop a park and then gentrification comes. But they did this thing in LA where they took parks, you could only build a park if you also did the affordable housing. So now all of a sudden you have opened yourself up to two sources of funding as well. It's not just park development here and affordable housing here. Now you can kind of pair it together and it can come together. And, and I thought that was a really interesting idea on how to start to, to uh, develop this. But this idea of park coin was that you hit, if you are, you know, I'll, I'll go to the next thing. If you're homeless or if, you are, if you're in Lincoln Park and you have more money than you know what to do with, if you volunteer in the parks, if you pick up trash, if you, you get paid in Parkcoin, and what does Parkcoin do? Parkcoin buys you affordable housing credits and utilities. That's it. You can't buy a meal with it. You can't do anything else. This is what you get with your Parkcoin. But it's an idea, it's a crazy idea, I know, uh, but it's not taxed, right? And if you are if you are a homeless guy and you start picking up trash in the parks, you get paid with park coin. You can use that park coin to either you know pay your well, you wouldn't have utilities if you're homeless, but you get affordable housing credits, and maybe that's an idea that starts to develop. Or if you're in Lincoln Park and you're picking up trash. You get, you get to lower your utility bill. I gotta get comment and people's guests to buy into this. But it's, it's an interesting idea that may start to deal with both of these issues of, of park maintenance, because everybody, the park district complains about that. We don't have enough people to maintain our parks. And it deals with this affordable housing issue and deals with the rising prices of utility bills. So. Um, We'll see where that goes. Um, I, I, you know, I'm still kind of developing how do you get this out to the general public, but um, those are the ideas, and so I'm willing to take any questions that you might have. Thank you.